is Mary Mena Adriana Eva. I'm a psychologist with a background in transpersonal psychology and behavior therapy. And today I'm going to talk about the evil eye phenomenon in Greece. I do have some trouble with the English one as well, but it doesn't matter. So for the latter aims, this presentation aims to, uh, to focus on some key phenomenological aspects of the evil eye phenomenon, which can be understood as a threefold process that includes a diagnosis, a treatment, and a prevention phase. Eventually, each aspect will be thoroughly examined, both from a focal per perspective, sorry, as well as from different scientific angles. So first of all, what's the term evil eye referring to? And what are the alleged necessary and sufficient conditions for its appearance? Well, the evil eye phenomenon, widely known as machiasma or pascania in Greek, can be roughly classified as a widespread intuitive folk or superstitious belief according to which envious people can harm others through the power or energy that's transmitted through malevolent glare. Consequently, the latter phenomenon may be treated as a multi-layered process that builds upon at least five distinct components. In more detail, an envious, jealous, or upset agent, also known as machiastis, is supposed to consciously or unintentionally use his eyes in order to harm the receiver, or machiasmenos, through an ostensible negative energy transmission that can result in several sudden and logically inexplicable misfortunes or abrupt psychosomatic symptoms such as stomach or headaches, yawning, nausea, mood swings, etc. <coughs> Eventually, one attributes to the power of an evil glare, these symptoms may be further treated in unconventional ways. The repertoire of this healing process, traditionally known as xemachiasma, varies and may take the form of a secret prayer or other more elaborate rituals. On the other hand, it is believed that an evil eye curse may also be prevented by taking several prophylactic measures, which include the use of amulets and other powerful objects. At this point, it should be emphasized that the evil eye is an extremely widespread belief in Greece. Accordingly, it is supposed to commonly occur during everyday interactions and affect nearly anyone, both acquaintances and perfect strangers. Nevertheless, some scholars point out several unique attributes that characterize the most dangerous senders and the most vulnerable receivers, respectively. In line with the folk tradition, people with blue eyes and or thick eyebrows are more likely to become senders of negative energy. The latter condition may be explained in terms of facial distinctiveness, given that light-colored eyes are generally rare in Greece. Similarly, thick eyebrows are supposed to enhance the intensity of the look. Additionally, social outcasts, doomsayers, childless, old women, etc., are also commonly targeted as probably envious and thus dangerous, or simply put jinxes. On the other hand, the victim's beauty, high social status, virtue, or uh, distinctiveness are also commonly uh, targeted as typical triggers of envy. Thus, the most vulnerable targets are believed to be amongst others, new mothers, their newborn children, but also animals, and inanimate yet fancy objects. Eventually, according to several scholars, the latter overemphasis on the vulnerability factor implies an early attempt to attribute meaning and causality to tragic and incomprehensible events, as in the case of a sudden child loss, by appealing to a superstitious explanatory framework like the evil eye phenomenon. So moving on to the healing phase, I would like to remind you that the evil eye uh, builds upon the premise that people's uh, intentions or primarily negative emotions can be transmitted through the eye of the sender 
and affected receivers health, wolf, and general well-being. Reversely, positive emotions and positive energy as well are needed for the healing uh, process of xemachiasma, namely the diverse, formal, or idiosyncratic curse undoing rites, which may take the form of a secret prayer or other more complicated rituals that make use of water, ash, coal, uh, wax, oil, etc. So next with regards to the healer's identity, these are usually lay specialists, neighbors, friends, or relatives who are familiar with the relevant prayer and are not supposed to give it away thoughtlessly or else they might lose the ability to cast away the evil eye. Sometimes people do also call a priest to bless their houses or read a prayer for overlooking and rarely they might also pay some so-called experts for more elaborate anti curse rituals. Interestingly, Greeks also believe that face-to-face -face or long-distance amachiasma can be equally effective. Ultimately, yawning is generally considered as an indication of a successful healing process. So finally, in addition to the treatment process, there are also several prophylactic measures that can be taken in order to avert the ostensible energy of the evil eye. These include the use of talismans and other semi-magical, sacred, or religious objects, such as salt, red threads, blue beads, or the Holy Cross. Fairly widespread is also the use of some specific plants, such as rue or garlic, that are supposed to guard against the negative energy in general. Some folklorists believe that it may be due to the repulsive odor that is expected to discourage any energy centers. Next, of particular interest, is the use of some Greek apotropaic amulets consisting of blue glass with an eye painted on them, widely known as matakia, which literally means little eyes. As Russo points out, given that it is primarily the human eye that transmits a form of electromagnetic waves which cause the evil eye, Matakia act as a mirror to reflect the gaze away from its recipients. Furthermore, the reflective power of the glass itself is meant to not simply block but also refract the energy back to the universe and as a result it is thought to be the best material which the evil eye amulets are made from. Lastly, when people express their admiration out loud, often they do also perform some so-called compensatory actions in order to neutralize the power of an unintentional spell casting. So most usually they spit out three times and say something like, evil eye, go away. In practice, this apparently random or even absurd uh, ritual could be an intuitive health prevention strategy that relies upon the antiseptic properties of saliva. So at this point, before we move on to the available explanations, we may, we may wonder why framing the eye of all the organs? In order to answer the latter question, we have to consider two complementary theories. According to the first approach, the eye is not just yet another organ, but also a nearly universal meaningful, sacralized, or even demonized symbol for it expresses but also elicits strong emotions. According to several anecdotal accounts and legends, witches, for example, can intimidate their victim through a fatal glare. Similarly, Medusa, a terrifying mythological mermaid, sorry, was said to turn people into stones by her looks. On a different level of analysis, sparse linguistic hints do also indicate a direct link between the eye and the expression of emotions. The English word envy, for instance, is derived from the Latin word uh, invidia, meaning to look in a hostile manner. Similarly, what known is the eyes as the windows to the soul metaphor implying the acquisition of information about someone's inner world simply by observing their looks. 
All in all, in accordance with the approach presented, the emphasis on the eye as a scenic phenomenon for the evil eye phenomenon is far from random. On the other hand, another explanation can be traced back to the old extra emission theories of vision. So as Gross points out, the earliest idea about vision is that it depends on light that streams out of the eye and detects surrounding objects. This view was attacked and finally disproved, yet the idea of a beam leaving the eye persisted and is still widely held among both children and health, healthy X-ray adults. Thereupon, this fire in the eye scheme, which implies that some sort of energy comes out of the eye, could probably account for several intuitive beliefs, including the evil eye phenomenon and probably the feeling of being stared at. So with that in mind, we are now going to review some more or less accepted scientific theories with regards to uh, the phenomenon of Ascania. So first we will survey the anthropological perspective that gives more weight on the vitamin function and less on the authenticity of the evil eye superstition and related practices. Next we'll try to explain Ascania in psychological terms and lastly, in order to fill any knowledge gaps, we'll also discuss some alternative proposals, such as the analysis theory of uh, psychobolia. Uh, at this point, however, it should be emphasized that what follows is mainly theoretical in nature, given the apparent lack uh, of systematic experimental research and any empirical evidence. So first we will review some anthropological explanations which are primarily functional in nature and do not try to uh, validate the verticality of the evil eye experience. In line with the most prominent theories, the evil eye superstition can be treated as a primitive belief whose function is both normative and interpretative. As Abu Rabia highlights, the evil eye is both a retrospective explanation of misfortune, but also a powerful incentive to conform to norms of social behavior, especially good neighborliness, reciprocity, and charity. In that sense, similar beliefs constitute a primordial social moral code that regulates social life and relationships. Consequently, disobedient, hostile, envy, or divergent people may be considered as table breakers, the scapegoats, in other words, that are to blame for any inexplicable, unfortunate condition. Reversely, these and other false belief and rituals can be understood as an early attempt to make sense and eventually take control of adverse events which in turn give rise to some non-scientific metaphysical explanations. So undeniably, the latter proposal aims to shed light on the original cause and dynamics that encourage the development and dissemination of the evil eye beliefs and practices. However, it cannot easily explain why this superstition is so deeply entrenched to this day, despite the radical changes in the social fabric. So next, from a mainstream point of view, the evil eye superstition is usually explained away as a romantic yet meaningless tale, mainly due to an apparent lack of well-substantiated theories and or any empirical evidence. Nevertheless, I tried to put some fragmentary pieces of the puzzle together in order to present a potentially viable psychological explanatory model. So broadly speaking, the evil eye phenomenon can be understood as some sort of a false belief or cognitive bias that gets activated in view of inexplicable ominous events. Accordingly, an ostensibly successful cure of the, of the alleged curse reinforces both the power of that false belief but also the motive to take precautions in order to avoid similar instances in the future. Eventually, these so-called safety behaviors tend to further confirm that false belief via the mistaken attribution of a person's good fortune to the power of the talisman. 
So at, at this point, it seems useful to examine each phase separately. So first of all, what about the origin of the evil eye superstition per se? Well, these and other uh, similar beliefs may be the result of the so-called thought-action fusion process, namely a type of cognitive bias that leads to the erroneous assumption that thoughts or emotions are equivalent to actions or increase the likelihood that an event will occur, as Inoz and colleagues put it. In other words, the sender's negative intentions or envious feelings can literally harm the victim. So when further strengthened by the extra mission theories of vision mentioned earlier, this latter, the latter fusion sorry, might eventually turn into a meaningful and solid worldview that can account for any fuzzy or logically inexplicable event. So in other words, when bad things happen for no apparent reason, well then it is the evil eye to blame. That's the final diagnosis period. So next comes the healing phase. What happens during that process is far from paranormal or mysterious according to the mainstream approach, but rather the result of anxiety regulation and a random resolution of the so-called psychosomatic symptoms possibly combined with some sort of a suggestibility and uh, uh, placebo effects, along with a tendency to ignore any ineffective treatment sessions and only recall the successful ones. Lastly, the use of talismans and matakia provides people with an illusion of mastery and builds upon some primitive psychological uh, belief systems named the laws of sympathetic magic after Fraser and Mouse, according to which the image equals the object. Thus, the IFG in our case can absorb the negative energy instead of the person. What remains unanswered though is what causes the original negative event, be it bad luck or bodily distress, in the first place. Additionally, if these symptoms are the result of a stress re reaction and the resolution is due to stress reduction, what about those instances with no apparent stressor? Are we talking about some ill-defined nocebo effects, namely health impairing negative expectations? Uh, lastly, how are we supposed to comprehend those healing rituals addressed to non-human targets, such as animals, uh, are not supposed to be affected by the um, stress reduction and reaction effects mentioned earlier. In order to answer these questions, we have to review some alternative theories which may hold the key to unraveling the mystery behind the evil eye phenomenon. So lastly, we are going to examine some less conventional theories with regards to casting and removing the evil eye. The prominent medical doctor and scholar of parapsychology, Agilos Tanagas, was probably the first contemporary Greek scientist who formulated an alternative theoretical model for the evil eye phenomenon back in the early 1930s. In more detail, his theory of psychobolia, which resembles the old extra mission theories of vision to some extent, states that people's aura, energy, or some sort of energy field can be literally projected outwards and further affect other uh, living or inanimate entities. Furthermore, he believed that this alleged unconscious or intentional energy transmission may be amplified under specific conditions, including pregnancy or fasting, that can charge the subject with an overabundance of energy. Similarly, when it comes to curse undoing, the healing process of xamachiasma may be also understood as some sort of intentional spiritual energy exchange between the healer and the victim that requires entering some sort of a suggestible altered state of consciousness, the latter term standing for any spontaneous or induced mental conditions that differ from the normal waking state. Practically, this process resembles the so-called psychic healing phenomenon, which may also involve a psychokinetic component. 
namely a tangible effect of the healer's positive intentions or consciousness on the healer's bodily condition without utilizing any other known uh, pharmaceutical or medical means of intervention. If that be the case, it would then be easier to explain some more complicated healing rituals aiming to remove the evil eye from non-human targets, such as animals or even objects, which are not supposed to be affected by the placebo stress reduction effects mentioned earlier. In sum, it could be presumed that the evil eye might operate to some extent at least as a physical force, probably independent of distance. The main difficulty here lies, of course, in the identification and measurement of this hitherto undiscovered elusive energy. All in all, there are too few data upon which to base a definite conclusion with regards to the nature and mechanisms of the evil eye phenomenon. So in order to conclude, we might need to review the original definition of the evil eye phenomenon. So as already mentioned before, the evil eye or Vascania refers to an ancient and pervasive, pervasive folk belief according to which envious people can harm others through a spiteful glare. Within that context, fake or inexplicable psychosomatic symptoms <coughs> and even misfortunes are often attributed to evil eye enchantments and consequently treated in ritualistic ways. Eventually, the evil eye curse may also be prevented by taking several prophylactic apotropaic measures, which include the use of lucky charms and other sacred objects. According to the mainstream approach, the evil eye phenomenon is a mere superstition that dates back to primitive and less scientifically informed worldviews and theories. Unfortunately, within that framework, these and other similar beliefs are usually explained away. Reversely, different scholars aim to normalize the latter phenomenon by resorting to several psychological concepts, some of which, however, remain largely ill-defined. Lastly, some skeptics are not fundamentally opposed to alternative theories, provided, however, that all other normal explanations are ruled out first. Therefore, the evil eye may also be a genuine psychokinetic phenomenon, possibly indicating a mind over matter effect. Nevertheless, given the anecdotal nature of the available data, its evidential status is highly questionable. Consequently, systematic and in-depth content and process-oriented investigations are required before drawing a firm conclusion. Thank you all very much.